All right, good afternoon. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Hopefully we don't want to buy cookies over there. Um, and so I'm Professor Roeder, Chris, if you don't know me. Um, so we're really lucky today to have um, a number of wonderful panelists here with us. Um, Elaine Clarkson from World Relief, as well as Michelle Clo, also from World Relief. Um, we have Professor Parvez Ahmed here as well from UNF, and of course Professor Curran um, from the Immigrant and Human Rights Clinic, all things clinical and experiential, and then myself. So, um, so hopefully we'll, our panelists and, um, will not take up the whole hour, we're hoping to take up about a half of the time maybe a little bit more, um, and then open it up to questions from you. So this is sort of our plan, some of the questions that we're, we're going to try to address. And of course, um, no panelist is limited to these kind of questions. Um, you're welcome to say whatever you wish, obviously. And then hopefully there'll be more questions from you about, um, about the Syrian situation, and about what we can and should do about it. Um, so we can start, you know, I suppose, with acknowledging, um, you know, the tragedy that happened um, in Paris. And of course, we have a lot of students. Um, many of you have been there, right? Um, for our summer programs, we have graduates who are teaching in France, um, in really close relations there. And of course, um, the attacks there has changed the. Uh, the conversation considerably when it came to refugees, or when it's come to refugees, particularly um, Syrian refugees. You know, before the attacks, the world community was all about what can we do, including um, America. And it seems like that rhetoric has, has changed drastically. Right? And some of it started with the governors, you know, getting on the bandwagon and, and writing letters about how they weren't going to cooperate with resettlement, and they didn't want refugees coming to their states. And um, and of course, most of that is just rhetoric, because for those of you in constitutional law, you all know that the governors really have no role to play in immigration um, unless they're playing a cooperative role with the federal government. But the federal government really um, constitutionally is, is the branch of government that gets to deal with immigration and set immigration policy um, states can decide they don't want to cooperate with that if they don't want to take federal funds. Um, but if they are taking federal funds and they are participating in the programs, they can't pick and choose which refugees to exclude based on their national origin or their religion or any of a number of things that I think um, even a common sense person reflecting on in a minute would realize are completely antithetical to our values and our constitutional rights and, and duties, right? So um, states can't pick and choose in that way. They can't discriminate in that way. Now, of course, the federal government um, can a little bit more. Um, so if Congress actually does pass some kind of bill, which is doubtful, but maybe the House, but the Senate probably not, and of course, President Obama said he would veto it, but if they did, they could change immigration policy, and they can, in some ways, discriminate about, in terms of limits and so on, of people from different countries. But again, even there, I think, you know, some of the views of people that we could somehow limit, or that Congress could limit refugees to Christians, or, or something like that, again, would, would clearly violate our Equal Protection Clause and our constitutional um, rights and our constitutional duties. So with that said, I'll turn um, the mic over to uh, Professor Curran. And we do have a mic at the tables if anybody wants to speak from the table. But if you want to come up here, the mic should be working up here as well. So I was thinking we'd maybe just go down the row um, and Professor Curran will maybe say a few things about um, what a refugee is, what the process is for gaining refugee status, and then um, I'll turn it over to our other panelists. Okay. Um, I talk all the time to y'all, so I'm going to try to go quickly um, so I can pass it on to the experts that we have from, from the community. 
Um, but those of you that um, are in our clinical programs or are familiar with the Immigration Clinic and our Citizenship Day project, World Relief is one of our biggest partners. They work with our pro bono programs and um, refer a lot of clients to us, and we refer our clients to them. Um, they serve victims of human trafficking and refugees, and I just can't say enough about the amazing work they do in the community. So I just pulled a, a couple of quick, um, fast facts for us to get the conversation going. 12 million Syrians are estimated to have fled their homes because of the conflict, and over half are children. 4 million Syrians are refugees. Most of them are in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Only about 800,000 have made it to Europe. Children affected by the Syrian conflict are at risk of becoming ill, malnourished, abused, and exploited. And, um, and um, here's a map to sort of give you sort of a sense. Um, I know everyone knows where Syria is, but just in case anybody needs a refresher, um, we are American, we're far away. Um, but this is a long journey that folks are making. I did a marathon. Um, earlier in the in the year and when I was walking and ready to quit <laughs> I was thinking about that um, that journey that that people take um, so why are Syrians fleeing um, the violence since the Syrian civil war began more than 240 um, 240,000 people have been killed including 12,000 children um, collapsed in, in infrastructure within Syria, healthcare, education systems, and other infrastructure have been destroyed. An estimated 4.8 million people are in areas of Syria that are difficult to access due to the conflict. And Syrian children um, have lost families and their um, children at risk for being recruited to serve as, as fighters. So what is our obligation? Um, the U.S. has a, a proud history of admitting refugees um, of special humanitarian concern, which our, our partners at World Relief will talk about. Um, and, and I know on the media there's been this image of that ship um, off the coast of Florida of refugees that we didn't accept during the World War II period. And that's something that I think has really hit home with a lot of us because we realized in retrospect we just couldn't imagine how we would have turned away those um, children and families, um, you know, that were then returned and subjected to um, the Holocaust, the horrors of the Holocaust. And, and so I know that image has struck home for us. We, we did not accept Anne Frank. I know for many of us, when we were in elementary school um, or middle school, we read the diary of Anne Frank, and I know that was a really powerful story for me. And she was a refugee that was not, not accepted during that period. Um, so we, we are signatories to the um, UN Refugee Convention, and we codified um, in our um, Refugee Act of 1980 our obligations to, um, to the refugee standard and the principle of non refoulement being that we're not going to send people back who face persecution based on five protected grounds. A persecution based on religion, race, nationality, membership in a particular social social group. So these are these are um, obligations that we've made. Now, of course, um, this protection is limited so such that we are not obligated to accept individuals who are persecutors or who come to our country to um, to commit crimes or who have committed atrocities. So we do have, because of that, very stringent um, protections. And we've passed around an infographic that's on the whitehouse.gov on um, the, the, the very um, stringent protocols that we already have in place to ensure that we're um, letting in the right people. And I'm sure the World Relief folks will talk about that. But I can tell you as an immigration attorney, most of the refugees I represented, and before I worked at Florida Coastal, I was a staff attorney at Jacksonville Area Legal Aid in the Refugee Project. And um, and worked with refugees, and it would you know there were stories of up to you know two to ten years families being um, waiting to get into the United States, and only about fifty percent of the applicants that we are referred from the UN, the initial um, starting place, actually um, make it to the United States. Um, we typically um, we settle about eighty five thousand people in the United States, and we're estimated to only um, accept ten thousand refugees. Most of the refugees are still in Jordan, in Turkey, I 
and very few have made it out. And most of those who have not made it to Europe are women and children because it's much more difficult for women and children to migrate. And that's the population that we would be looking at resettling. Um, but I can tell you the, the waits are long. And even after refugees get to the United States, the process that they face um, when, once they're here, one year after the arrival, they're required to apply for permanent residence. And then they're subjected to a whole another series of stringent background checks. Um, and I can tell you, uh, I think Governor Scott recently said that you know, he was concerned that um, the White House wasn't going to release the security check information. And I can tell you, they don't for national security reasons. So if I have a client that is stuck in some type of security check, I don't even know that they are. There's just this delay or wait. And we don't know why is this immigration case taking so long. Um, and it's taking so long because there are so many stringent background checks. And a lot of innocent people get caught in the background checks because they have the same name as somebody else or a similar birth date or they're in some document or whatever. So it's really a thorough, complicated process, one that I complain about all the time. <laughs> so it's interesting to me that we're considering adding even more. And I think that additional step would shut the system down um, because we don't have a protocol in place and it, it, it's really <coughs> more than it is needed. So with that, I'll pass it on down the lane. Thank you. Now, Professor Erica, we're delighted to be with you today. Okay. And really appreciate all of you that work in the um, immigration clinic yes. serving our people. But, uh, it's a big blessing to them. Um, I've been serving refugees in Jacksonville since 1988 as a volunteer with Lutheran Services for three years, and then in 1991 uh, was able to open World Relief uh, Office and um, served over 5,000 refugees. I do, I didn't have one that was deported. Um, he was a uh, domestic violence to his wife and his children. And he was given many chances to change his ways, give up his alcohol, and, and love his family, but uh, he couldn't make it, so he finally was deported. Other than that, I've seen some beautiful people, great people, people that are really thankful to be here and um, want to learn. But we, we put a lot of emphasis in our office on integration. We want them to become a part of Jacksonville, not to be their own little ethnic community to a side, but to mix and mingle with us, learn our ways, and we get to learn some of their ways too. Um, I tell you, the Iraqis have the best food. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, um, I've had a lot of good food from around the world, but uh, the Iraqis take it for me. Uh, uh, yes. So this is. Um, my third crisis in my years, um, September the 11th was the first, and that really hit us hard. That hit the refugee program hard. And um, I had had 300 arrivals in that year, and then um, went down to 37 the next year. So they really tightened things up. Uh, they closed down a lot. Um, so that was a it was hard on us, of course, it was hard on the whole country, and um, certainly hard on the refugees overseas that was longing for freedom. Um, and then, um, I don't remember what year it was, but there was, a, they found a, um, some guys, some refugee guys in Kentucky who were collecting arms to go overseas. And so then we had about a three month wall. They slowed things down and uh, tied, tightened up security once again. So, and now we're there, we're number three. <laughs> Hopefully this is the last one. <laughs> um, but uh, I understand, um, I have a family, I have children, I have grandchildren, I have great-grandchildren. And um, I want them to enjoy the American life. Um, so I want this place to be safe. I understand security, I appreciate security. And I'm very thankful for those who can come through and can have another chance for freedom. So, uh... Well, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Clough, and I've uh, been with World Relief about six years. And I am the um, 
technical in-house term is RMP a coordinator, which really means I'm the refugee services manager. So the uh, World Relief, as Miss P said, her nickname's Miss P. You'll never hear her called Elaine Carson. Mm -hmm. So. Um, or uh, a resettlement agency, and our services are pretty much dictated by the State Department. We are required to perform certain services within a certain amount of time, and um, those services are the same at any resettlement agency. And so one of those things is we will be sent information about a family, and we have to review it. Can we serve this family? Are there certain needs that they have that we can meet? So we put a lot of thought into these cases before they even come. And um, then when we assure it or say yes, they can come to Jacksonville, we have services in place. Um, they will, uh, the next thing we get is arrival notice. And at that point, we secure housing. We get them an apartment, and as you know, it's really difficult to get an apartment without a social security, without a background check, without income, but we have these wonderful apartment complexes that work with us, mostly because of Ms. P's reputation and her relationship with them. And so we set up an apartment, we furnish it from every, from the kitchen, the bedroom, and I think we just said, uh, we went to, um, Florida Coastal Students House today to pick up a bunch of furniture that she donated for us. So we've had Florida Coastal students make dinners for uh, arriving refugees. They've been friendship partners. They've gone to the airport to pick up refugees and they give quite a few donations. So we set up apartments. Um, they'll be assigned a caseworker. Um, they, the State Department expects their uh, case to be uh, closed in 90 days and that they will be self-sufficient in 90 days. So you can imagine that is a tall order. So we um, put them through a ton of services. They are eligible to apply for their social security. They go and get another health screening down at the health department. The children get enrolled in school. They get their immunizations. We sign them up for English classes. They attend cultural orientation. But one of the unique things about World Relief is um, our friendship program. And we, when people say, I want to volunteer, what can I do to help? This is something you can do to help. It's a wonderful program and it's where you just say, yes, I will be their friend with them. I will walk with them through these 90 days and help them. Whether that means helping them understand how to ride the bus, how to shop at Walmart, understanding money, just cultural things, just being their friend. I love this one story of a, um, she was, she had got, just gotten out of college, started her job, and she heard about World Relief, and she's like, I want to be a friendship partner. So she was a friendship partner to a young family with two small children. And every Saturday, she would go over there. And they would be waiting for her, waiting for her. And she's like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. I'm just talking, and we eat, drink tea, and they make me food. And, and you know, she took them to the beach, and she taught them how to count money. And she didn't come one Saturday and call her, where are you, where are you? Well, um, come to find out, the woman was pregnant. And when it came time for her to name the baby, they asked the friendship partner, you name the baby. We will never forget you, and we want you to give um, the baby her name. And she called us, and she said, am I supposed to do that? Is that OK? And so yeah, you better name that baby. That's a high honor. So just the importance of befriending somebody who's come to a country where they don't know the language, they have no idea who's picking them up at the airport. And so when they see a friendly face with balloons welcoming them, you can just see this relief. You know, their, their whole face just softens, and like, oh, someone's here to get me. So we have um, all of those services, and again, as I said, within 90 days. And um, if you are interested in volunteering with World Relief, uh, you go through a orientation process just to understand what we do do, what we don't do, and uh, what your role is or what part you can play. We also love to partner with people who can provide jobs. If you want, um, through this whole Syrian um, talk and, and crisis, we've had a lot of calls to World Relief wanting to help. And one call was, I have a group of women at church and we want to teach all the Syrians English. Let us know when they come. Another one saying, we want to give them jobs. So we just really appreciate the partnership with Florida Coastal. We appreciate your interest 
to um, hear what you can do, and we would love for you to come and, and just visit us. Come and see who we are. Come and see our refugees and get a feel for um, where you can fit in. Thank you. Uh, my name is Parvez Ahmed. I'm a professor of finance at the uh, University of North Florida. I also write on American Muslim issues and on the American Muslim experience. Recently, Chris and I went on a, on a radio show over here for Swiss Connect talking about uh, the fallout post Paris. What was interesting to me is, you know, in any culture, uh, refugees are considered the most vulnerable population. Um, whichever culture you talk about in the world. And there is generally, whether the culture, whether the country can afford to resettle refugees or not, there is generally a lot of empathy for uh, refugees. And you would think that refugees would be the kind of the last group that our political discourse would pick on. But here we are today. Um, they are being demonized. Today's, um, Chris, do you have any technology? If you pick up the Times Union today, there is an editorial cartoon in the Times Union. Um, if you have not seen it, um, it's, it's, a, it's a picture, it's a cartoon of Obama uh, with the Statue of Liberty uh, kind of sign with a thing holding over here, Syrian refugees, and it says, Give the states your tired, your poor, your ISIS terrorists disguised as Hamu masses yearning to breathe free. I mean, this is not leading newspaper in the, in, the, in the city. And I wrote to the newspaper editor this morning, I said, neither, this is neither funny nor exact accurate. And typically, when you think about satire, which cartoons are generally designed to do, you generally satirize people that are in positions of power. You do not satirize the vulnerable. And you certainly do not send, spread misinformation about the vulnerable. The Syrian refugees are fleeing ISIS persecution. They are, they are the victims of ISIS persecution. Uh, and, and as we have seen through all the previous discussions, uh, the refugee resettlement process in the U.S. is probably the most orderly and the most stringent immigration process that we have. I'm an, I'm an immigrant to this, to this country. I came a long time ago as a student, then I got my green card and then my citizenship. Every step, there are hurdles and hoops and background checks that you go through. It is an arduous process, and I do know refugee process is much more arduous than any of the normal uh, immigration process that we have. Not to mention the fact that post 9-11, uh, this morning, uh, Vox did a nice uh, graphical uh, story about uh, what's, this, what's the security situation post 9 11 in our country. They have been they've documented about 26 terrorist attacks in this country since 9 11. Uh, 19 of them were committed by white male, uh, 7 of them were committed by people who were of the Islamic, the Muslim background. And of those 26 attacks, none of all of them were American citizens. Um, so this demonization of somebody who is vulnerable, who do not have a voice in the political process, and who are being picked on is beyond the pale. And the last thing I want to mention is that this demonization is actually connected to a larger narrative that is playing out on our, on our, in our public airwaves, on, you know, on the media, as well as in our political discourse today, um, that I thought we have gone past. But it seems like this is 2015, but it feels like it is. We are still stuck in the 19th century. Um, the discourse is about Muslims in this country, and Muslims in general, Islam in general, Muslims in general. And Islamophobia is palpable. You know, one presidential candidate, Ben Carson, compared refugees to rabid dogs. Uh, uh, ben Carson and Donald Trump are both peddling this lie uh, that there were Muslims in New Jersey who were cheering after 9 11. As the towers were falling, these Muslims were cheering. It's a lie. It's as monstrous as a lie as the protocols of the elders, elders of Zion, that, that is the troll, that's the anti Semitic troll that goes on in the internet. It's one thing to have shadowy fringe groups spreading misinformation and rumors. It's a whole other level of uh, dystopia to see presidential candidates spreading this rumor. And these two issues are connected. Because on my Facebook page, I, in, on the, in the last few days, I started to unfriend people. Because the trolling just got way over. It's just people are saying things and they're connecting things. We have to stop the ISIS, uh, refugees because they're ISIS. There is no connection between the refugees and ISIS. The refugees that are coming into the US first uh, and ISIS. Um, is it possible that a refugee can, can slip in as a, as, a, as a terrorist through the system? Yeah, anything is possible. But we have to be realistic in our assessment what is the probability of 
doing this, uh, having this uh, happen. Now, US is not France, US is not Europe. People are not just screaming across our borders as the impression is created, as if people are swimming across the Atlantic Ocean and coming on our seashores <laughs> and seeking refuge. It's not happening. Uh, and yet that's the kind of impression that, 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 that has been created out there. Um, so I think we have to look at this thing. We are standing at a very critical moment in our history. Not only history will judge us how we treat the most vulnerable amongst us, but how we respond to this overall climate of uh, picking on a minority population and picking on a religion as a way to discriminate and to, to gather votes. Uh, it, it, is a, it is, in my view, one of the most troubling periods that I have lived in this country in the 27 years that I've been an immigrant to this country. All right, well, thank you. So, sorry. Okay, so um, I think the panel is long and able and ready to take any and all questions from you. So, if you have a question, if you could. Can you speak loudly, loudly for a Yes, sir, I can. Um, <laughs> uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, one of the speakers said it's more difficult for um, uh, women and children to, to come over than men. Uh, uh, just a technical question. What, why is that? I think that just has to do generally with mobility and liberty. Um, that women, women with children typically, they can't leave. Young men are able to migrate on their own. We see that even with migratory patterns from Central America and Mexico coming to the United States. Um, and not necessarily in the legal sense, there's not a gender bias, but it's just that, that um, it's more dangerous for women to, to migrate, and it's more difficult for women with children to migrate, and women often are the ones caring for the children. Thank you. I don't think I can speak as loud or speak to this gentleman in front of you, but I'll give a shot. Um, my question is, um, one, thank you to this distinguished panel of knowings for coming here today. Um, I think it's very important that we get all sides of any story, so for that I'm very grateful. I would like to um, state that one of the issues that I have in trying to gather information and be analytical and rational is that in, both in the news and with um, the government in answering questions, nothing is answered direct. If I ask or a question is being asked, if the person is on one side or another, it becomes accusatory and political, and I think that that demeans the situation and takes the ball, um, takes the eyes off the ball. So my question for you today is, when people ask questions about the refugees, whether um, they're from Syria, Iraq, wherever, when we are doing it in mass, and Ms. P, who uh, said that in 2001, you had 300 arrivals and you were overwhelmed at that time, what would 10,000 do for you? When I see immigration co uh, immigrants coming in, um, I see the, I personally have dealt with um, overcrowding in schools, overwhelming of teachers. It creates a psychological problem for the children that are in an environment already, not to mention all the adjustments that the people coming in have to do on a hundred full time basis. The questions that I have are all economic. Our hearts are open. Our history is there. How do we pay for all this? How do we do that when we have 49% of America on welfare ourselves? We can't find jobs for the people in our own country. How are we supposed to find jobs for whomever is coming here? And that basically is my question. I'm not a racist, and I really don't like being racist, and I would like a direct question answered. Where is this money coming from? We're broke. We're broke, not emotionally, not um, altruistically, financially, our country is broke. So how can we address those when we're using? Anybody on the panel can answer. I appreciate your question. But, uh, I too am a taxpayer. I am a taxpayer. And I understand uh, a little bit about the federal budget deficit. Um, that is not in my control. You know, I can talk to my congressman, I can uh, express my opinion, and you can too. Uh, but other than that, I look at refugee resettlement as this is my call in life to serve 
those that the government brings in. And one year we had 600 here in our office. There is an average, the three agencies in Jacksonville, and there's an average of about a thousand that come in per year to Jacksonville. Um, I have to say that my employment specialist um, has a 100% rate all to 2015 in finding jobs for refugees. There are companies that really want these people. They work hard. You can depend on them to be there for you. And um, uh, they're good workers. So we do have companies that actually call us and say, do you have another one of those? What was Bob saying? was Vietnamese, you know, it was Russian. And now it's well, Burmese was a, a large one of our last largest group. So um, the, the jobs are out there. There's so many, and we hear that so many Americans that aren't willing to take them. They don't want to work for the seven fifty or eight dollars an hour. So employment for the refugees at this point is not a problem. Lutheran has a state grant for employment, and um, they tell us once we have a social security card, which sometimes is a problem, just getting it through <laughs> time-wise, um, they have a job. They, they have a relationship with a number of companies in town, and jobs are available. Um, as far as it's like the school situation, we have a bi-monthly task force meeting. The school board is represented there. And they know we take their input. I was at the school board just last week um, saying we want to move our number from 500 to 600. Is the school ready to handle that? And they said yes for the boundary changes that they're talking about making that We've got plenty of room. So we do consult with the, the health department. We consult with the school board, um, social security, immigration. They are at our table uh, when we meet for a task force. And um, we work together for what is best for our city. And I would say, as far as getting your uh, information, the State Department has put out a lot of good information recently this that was just passed out they also did a background briefing on refugee screening and admissions on the 17th so go to the source you know go to uscis go to the state department go to unhcr you can go to the department of children and families uh, florida department of children and families to get your facts because you will hear and we are hearing different statistics um, so I would go to the source for your information. And um, as Ms. P said, we do work very closely with local authorities in Jacksonville. We plan out, okay, so you're going to be getting the 10,000 that um, is referenced for S Syrian refugees. That's across the United States. Uh, World Relief has 23 offices in the United States. There's nine resettlement agencies with I don't know how many offices. So that 10,000 is going to be spread through those nine agencies, through their offices throughout the US. Uh, we received 450, 38 maybe last year. And this year, we're expected to receive between five and 600 refugees. Does that answer your question? Somewhat, thank you. Um, as an economist, if you look at studies on refugee and their impact on the economy, at the very least, refugees put in what they take. And at the very best, they put in more than they take. Mm -hmm. Don't think of refugees coming in that they are uneducated. We are not investing anything in their education. When a child is coming in, their parents are also coming in. Most of these parents are highly educated. So you are getting a doctor or an engineer and a lawyer or a teacher Essentially, without spending a penny on them, are entrepreneurs. Many of the refugees open their own business. They don't take jobs, they end up creating jobs. Mm -hmm. And by the way, those of you who are using iPads and iPhones, <laughs> thank a Syrian refugee for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the net contribution refugees make to our, uh, to our, to our society. And what is very troubling to me is to see presidential candidates like, like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio whose parents were refugees, now demonize another group, and they were <clears throat> political persecution. 
We could have easily said, well, you know, coming from a country that is sponsoring violence against the country, you are not welcome over here. But this is this is perhaps the most troubling human folly that I have noticed in this debate. People who have benefited from our refugee program are often turning their backs on these refugees. And that is a crisis of morality. It's not a crisis of security in my view. And I'll just quickly reference um, a website, a bipartisan website called the Migration Policy Institute, www.migrationpolicy.org, which has really excellent statistics on um, the economic impact of migration. Um, and so that might be of use to you as well. I had a friend that died about three years ago. He is a Syrian. And an oral surgeon, by the way. Is there a path that his wife, who's an American, his widow, that she could bring her relatives, in-laws, to the United States beyond what your path is for your people? <laughs> we would be happy to do a screening in the clinic to see if there are any options. It's, I mean, it would, you'd have to have more specifics about what type of family members um, and and talk about that. But uh, give us a call. <laughs> so I wanted to say, um, to follow up to the gentleman's um, comment, um, I totally agree with you. I think most of us are first, second, third generation in this country. We came from someplace, eventually, uh, you know, uh, integrated ourselves within this community and the world often looks at America as the forerunner of human rights. We stand up as an example and I don't think this country has ever closed its doors to um, uh, to anyone coming here saying we're not doing well financially and, and with all due respect to what you mentioned it is, a, it is a huge problem. It is not a problem just in the U.S. Obviously the world is suffering from it but we have always somehow managed to do well. We've gotten through them. You know, when we look at history, the wave of refugees that came over from Europe, um, you know, most of the bridges are built by these refugees. They didn't have any medical insurance or anything. A lot of them died in building them. So there is a richness added to the culture of the Americans, you know, that from all this, we benefit from that. And, and um, like the gentleman mentioned, not just education, but who's to say? So we're not better, but we are an example for the rest of the world, and we cannot let our humanitarian, um, you know, idealism as abstract and, and, and uh, idealistic as it sounds, we, and we cannot let ourselves be overwhelmed by just a number. We have to remember what this country stood for and why it serves as an example for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I did a little uh, statistics checking, fact checking, and it's actually 35.4% of, um, of those who live here in America that live on welfare. And second off, um, the GDP with the immigration reform would actually lead to an increase of $1.2 trillion. And in addition to that, $9 billion or $900 billion of our tax dollars are going to war. So either we can welcome these immigrants who would take these opportunities, who everyone has the same equal opportunities, to go and get, get an education, to go and find and seek a job, just as much as an immigrant who comes to this country and make something of themselves, become productive, tax-paying members of society. There is no competition with the immigrant that comes from overseas or comes across our borders from Mexico. There's a competition with yourself, and that is the first thing that we are taught as soon as we step foot through this law school doors. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's excellent what you're doing. Um, America's history is very rich with refugee and everything. <laughs> I mean, the Quakers, you name it. Everybody came for a reason. And I don't. I think that um, the problem with um, America is just that it takes time for its heart and its arms to keep growing for each new group that comes. And um, I was just thinking, she was talking about children in schools in America being broke. I mean, America
is built on giving somebody a cup of sugar out your back porch. You know, you understand what I'm saying? And I think that a lot of if we we stop pushing back our borders and we start literally helping us, I hear a lot of people in here talking about jobs. And if you know about American history, it talks about business. And I think the gentleman on the end said something about that and laid back here. If you are focused on just getting a job, then you will be concerned about the next person trying to take your job. But if America, I don't know what happened about being first, being best in science, being best at this, being best at that. If you look at history, you will see a lot of people, even from the German Nazi war, a lot of the scientists came over and people are benefiting from medical technology. So if you know your history, you would know that, you know what, you want to be the best at what you can be. And, and, and the fact that an invisible force of people will stop me from achieving what I want to achieve for my family, I'm a, I'm a mother of six kids. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to stop telling people that you cannot ex succeed for this reason or that reason. But stick to what you want to do in life. Go get it. Get that grit that they talked about when we first came here. My name is Elias. I am a Syrian pharmacist. And I have a question about what is the main difference between a refugee and a Saidi? And does the bill include both of them? For refugees, I mean refugees from refugee camps and asylees who apply for asylum inside the United States. No, the, the bill addresses refugees. The asylum process has not been altered. It's extremely onerous. It's very difficult. But the difference between, in our legal system, between a refugee and an asylee is simply that a refugee has been determined to be a refugee overseas and they come into the United States with that status, and an asylum seeker is somebody who, had, who makes that claim either within the United States or at our borders. And then um, if they're um, not successful in making that claim, then they are placed in removal proceedings. Um, and and it's, very, it's very challenging to succeed on asylum claims. But that is the main difference. And the bill addresses refugees. It's addressing that process overseas. The security clearances and checks that take place on asylum seekers are also very stringent. Um, but those are people who are <coughs> knocking at our door or are already here. So let's say somebody came in on a student visa, the crisis ensues, and they don't feel safe coming home, then they could apply for asylum. And we that's the work that we do here at the school in our clinic. Um, we represent asylum seekers. Uh, with the recent surge in a lot of governors uh, coming out and basically refusing to accept these refugees, how do you combat that rhetoric and, and try to convince these people to get on board? Um, because, as you know, um, while the federal level uh, may have a lot of political power, I think for me the state level is where the real situation comes, because that's where you meet the hearts and minds of the people. And these governors are getting so much backing from their, from their base. And it's showing that you know a large group of people, um, either fear, concern, security reasons, are just not wanting to accept these these individuals. And how do you combat that situation? How do you like you know get these governors to change their minds? Talk to her. I'll be happy to talk to her as well. Ready right? <laughs> <laughs> to start by voting them out of office? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as, as Chris mentioned, and what they are attempting to do is unconstitutional. So it's not about having an empathy. The first thing that you swear an oath on when you get elected to public office is to defend the Constitution. Uh, if they do not have an understanding of the Constitution, how can they defend it? Um, so I think part of it is the, is the misinformation out there. Um, and and the fears that people are preying on. Um, but the trend towards this fear is not, it did not erupt on the day Paris was attacked. These trends have been there for a very long period of time. Some of it latent, uh, some of it um, out in the public, but I think they got 
that you know, people are definitely taking advantage of the tragedy in Paris. Now talk about benefiting from a tragedy. You know, certain people are sort of trying to make political hay out of this tra tragedy. Where there are very little connections to one story versus the other. You know, not so far as we know at this moment in time, all of the attackers in Paris that we know of right now who are European citizens. So why are we picking on Syrian refugees? Um, again, one does not correlate with other. So that's the kind of, and the statistics are there. All of the attacks in the US post 9 11 were carried out by American citizens. I think 80% of them or 90% of them were American citizens. Or maybe all of them, if I have the statistics, if I remember them correctly. So again, we are picking on somebody that we have no business with. It's one thing to be fearful, um, but it's one thing to be fearful based on just made up facts. Um, you know, this, this thing that Trump and Carson are talking that this is that they saw. How did they see thousand people cheering on 9 11 when nobody else has that information? It's a, it's a, it's a, a rumor out on the internet, and the broadest view is seen that, but nobody ever verified that story. In fact, people have refuted that story. But that's how you know, things are, and when you keep on repeating, I, I hate to invoke the Nazis over here, but this is kind of like that. Because when you lie, you lie big. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the strategy, right? Lie big, and you hope something good stick. You know, maybe thousands of not cheer, maybe five cheer. Maybe that will stick. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the discourse we have devolved into. And part of it, and I think um, the organizers of this panel, part of it is through this citizen discourse through having a public discourse, through having a civil dialogue over this. Yeah, I would, I would just say that I think, you know, the governors know that they don't have a role to play in immigration policy. And so their comments are largely political grandstand. They're taking advantage of an opportunity. And it's not new, I mean, throughout our history, you know, the tough on crime movement. I mean, it's easy to get people riled up for votes, um, to get them riled up for support if you can play on their fears. And it's just a very easy tactic that, you know, taps into something really deep in the back of our, you know, brain stem. Um, and it's unfortunate. And so, you know, if people, you know, write their governors, write their senators, you know, I mean, the things you even have done, you, you know, it's largely Republicans who are playing to this, but, you know, um, Hillary Clinton, I think, is also, you know, trying to get back tougher and, you know, play into that, you know, we have to be tough on people, we have to fight back, and that's the only way to solve these problems. Um, and, of course, the rhetoric, you know, just before the attacks in Paris with the same populations was completely the other way. Right? These are the same human beings. Mm -hmm. The same human beings that we were all pouring our hearts out to just before these attacks. All of a sudden, you know, you, you throw some fear in it and some fear mongering and, and we completely shift the other way. And so, you know, unfortunately it's a polit it's political season. So, you know, it fits into that easy sound bites and, and everything else. The, the bigger story is a longer story to tell. Sorry, um, yeah. yeah. <coughs> well, I, I would agree with everything Chris just said. I'll probably, whatever what I say will surely be more offensive to some. The people who have invoked uh, Nazism, uh, namely Carson and, and Trump, are, are really acting much closer to Nazis than anybody else in this whole equation. Uh, they should be told that. Uh, we've been told for eight years by Donald Trump lies about the president. And the president has had to put up with the utter, absolute bullshit that this president has had to put up with as to just his very legitimacy as an American citizen. And a lot of people have picked up on that because they're white and they're middle class and they're afraid of the other. And they produce a lot of uh, 
white people and others who are afraid of this. But being fearful and acting fearfully is, 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 is a great act of cowardice. And it's, of course, what uh, those who, for example, run the Islamic State or others, al Qaeda and others who are seeking to benefit from this, absolutely want to happen. There was a great piece in the New Yorker yesterday by George Packer that argued that we're all so fired up about Paris because we live in an age of social media where we're seeing it, right? It feels as though these terrorists are at our door. All of my neighbors are going out and getting concealed handgun permits because surely there will be Syrians coming down our street tomorrow. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't say that to make fun of the fear. The fear is real. There's no question that there are people in these organizations who would like to destroy us, and we should not diminish that at all. But the only way to deal with that, and I'll harken back to a you know, a, a truly great leader who had plenty of problems, but sat in a wheelchair one night and said, the only, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, but that came after Pearl Harbor. Um, being fearful and acting out of fear is just such an unprincipled, cowardly, I'm sad to say, now American, but in the past, not American way of doing things. Uh, I'm not proud at all of my politicians, and I actually feel disgraced and shamed by most of what comes out of this country. I think we're acting like very small, small people. Well, for those of us who are in the law, learning to be lawyers, training to be in this profession, we believe in, in rules and principles, and uh, we believe in valuing the, the merits of arguments rather than the loudness of somebody's voice, or the piggishness of their willingness to uh, appeal to our basis nature. Um, you know, Lincoln said, the better angels of our nature, this is one that is, is called for. So I, I would say it's our political discourse, as the professor said very eloquently. But I want to ask two questions now that I've said all that. And, and said, <laughs> basically, what we're talking about is playing to the base. Uh, truly, I just have to say this because it'll make me feel so good. F the base. <laughs> I'm tired of the base. I'd like to spend some time with the base and say, you're full of shit. why don't you read and make yourself less ignorant and make yourself proud to be an American instead of just shaming the rest of us with your utter stupidity. Yes. And if anybody wants to talk to me, I'm right here after the meeting. <laughs> Said. There are two questions that I think reasonable people have genuine difficulty with. There are probably more of these two. Number one, you said, Professor, uh, why are we picking on the, the refugees when they are uh, they do not are not identified as any of the <clears throat> terrorists we have here? And that's true. But one might respond. But when they come here, over time, there is a small percentage of them. This happens in, in Europe and everywhere else who become radicalized in some fashion. And so perhaps there's a greater uh, likelihood that some of those who come here peacefully and without any of those intentions may become homegrown terrorists and perform those kinds of acts that the 19 people did. The second, I think, is a much tougher question, and, that's a, and that is one that I've never felt was directly answered. Bill Maher has the biggest problem with this, and I like Bill Maher on 95% of, of the positions, and that is, is there something uh, for those of us who are not raised in Islam, who are not scholars of Islam, or who know a lot about it but feel perplexed about this, is, is there something inherent to Islam that at least some people who embrace it can take as a, a theological justification for the absolute measures of violence that they take against the rest of the world? Because that, to me, is, is perhaps the most important area, because everything else can be safe and we can still think, there's, there are people here who believe as a matter of core religion that, that the rest of us must be destroyed. That has to be responded to over time, obviously, in a, in a nuanced and careful way. Right. So thank you for your comments and your question. Um, great questions. Uh, the first question you asked was, is it possible that somebody who comes in as a refugee can get radicalized? <coughs> the one example that comes to my mind are the two Boston bombers, the, the, the brothers who bombed the Boston Marathon. Uh, they did get, they did, uh, I don't know if they came as refugees or if they came as legal immigrants, I don't know, I don't remember that. They didn't come as refugees. Um, so, but they, that's one example that I, that I can think of, but they came when they were kids, and they were radicalized over here. And they were radicalized primarily through the internet, and then they visited uh, Chechnya, or, uh, and then they got more radicalized over there. But they were also on our security radar. Just like the Keep some of the people that we see in France today. They were on our security river. That's a more important question to ask. Instead of asking the Muslim community, why aren't you rooting out the terrorists amongst your midst, ask the security agencies that if you have somebody on your radar, how come you didn't spot them before? How come you are monitoring my phone calls? <laughs> You're listening to everybody else's phone calls. So that's a bigger question we have. I mean, this actually raises a Profound policy question when we add this 
massive metadata collection. Now people are talking about getting backdoor encryptions uh, to break the encrypted, encrypted messages that we send to our uh, social media or uh, other, other media platforms. Is that going to allow you to find the needle in the haystack? If you keep on making the haystack bigger and bigger, then the needle becomes harder and harder to find. So instead of using old-fashioned police work, instead of relying on if there are people, I'll give you an example from Jacksonville. Um, I was at that time, uh, I was a board member for Islamic Center. One day, uh, one of the parents came to us and they said that uh, they heard somebody um, uh, that was kind of talking about Syria, jihad, stuff like that to their youngsters and they were not sure what the conversation was. So they came and brought it to our attention. Uh, we tried to first figure out what the conversation was. Is it just people talking or is there something uh, really that could be challenging for a security situation? Uh, we could not make a determination. So what, was the, what would be the most responsible thing for us to do? We called our local FBI. And we said, you know what, this is a, something that we have spotted, a young person, um, by the way, racially white, uh, male, is trying to recruit young people to possibly go to Syria for jihad, for, uh, for, for, to fight the Assad regime. Um, and we said, we cannot determine if this is protected free speech or this is really a security threat, but that's not my job to determine. You are the law enforcement, you figure this out. Uh, they, they followed the guy for a while, and ultimately they did catch him trying to cross over, I think, into Jordan or, or, or Syria. And now he's sitting in a jail over here. So when you ask what's the Muslim community doing, that's a tangible example of what the Muslim community in Jacksonville did. When they fought, although we did not have any direct evidence that this guy was indeed plotting to blow up something over here. But the mere suspicion that it can possibly happen Community leaders did what is the most responsible thing to do. Um, so, uh, is it possible? Sure, anything is possible. But anything is possible with American citizens over here. There are five million American Muslims living in this country. If you think Muslims are more prone to violence, then well, you have five million possible targets to survive. Um, but that's, again, that's what just creating a larger and larger haystack, and certainly you will not find the needle in that haystack as opposed to going through targeted, uh, pro, uh, targeted uh, law enforcement methods. And the vast majority of violence in this country is being done by terrorist violence. It's being done by people who are white and male and Caucasian and Christian. But nobody's putting Christianity on trial. Nobody's asking the question, is there something wrong with Christianity that young white male are walking into churches, black churches, and blowing people up? Did anybody ask that question? We even had our FBI director said, well, this may not be terrorism. Why is that not terrorism? Here is a young white guy who walks into a black church, guns down worshiper, leaves behind a manifesto talking about white supremacy. How is that not terrorism? So we have reserved the word terrorism for Muslims. And I think therein is a problem. Therein is the route to more radicalization. The more a young person in this country, a young Muslim growing up in this country, the more they feel alienated from society, the more likely they're going to look for other things for affinity. For they're going to look for other things that give meaning to their lives. And thus they are more prone to be radicalized. You cannot stop the flow of information enter. God knows what garbage is going to enter. Right? So the best way to protect the country, which is also, by the way, the right thing to do, is to treat the Muslim in this country just like you treat anybody else, as an equal citizen that deserves to live in dignity without feeling the threat that they're constantly under surveillance. The last question is a bigger question to answer, and I think we're running out of time, but I wish I had time and I would love to come back and just explore that question because I do think it's an important question to ask. Because on one hand, just one 30 second answer, on one hand you see some people who would point out, like those modern others, who would point out and say, well, there is something Islamic about this radicalism. And then there are others um, who would point out that there is nothing Islamic about this radicalism. I tend to believe the answer is somewhere in the middle. And what the middle point is, the, the, the irony of this, the people who are claiming that there is something Islamic about this radicalism are people who do not live that way. And the people who are saying there is nothing Islamic about this radicalism are also who have not actually taken the time to study 
the ideology that is fueling ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others. So where that, where that midpoint is and what that actually means is a very long discourse. Well, I, I just wanted to thank, and we would love to have you back. We can take you up on that um, that offer to come back. And I just want to thank, take this opportunity to thank all of you for being here, um, and um, all of our panelists for coming. And I think that that dialogue should continue, and also getting to know our neighbors. World Relief is here; they love to work with us, and you, for our students, um, be brave, enter in these discourses, get real information from solid sources. And you can, if you have any questions about our asylum and refugee law, please email me. I'm happy to send you the statute. So you can really um, represent accurate information. So thank you. I forgot to thank um, our Muslim Law Student Association and our International Law Student Association and our volunteer immigrants. Thank <laughs> you.